There are a few who deny that the Nightmare Before Christmas is a rich, spooktacular world where nothing is quite as simple as it seems. It's grown and evolved over the past few decades, and there are so many mysteries to dive into from the original movie, but then mix in a dash of, well, everything from video games to graphic novels and books and poems, and wow do we have something to obsess over. Hmm. So listen, everyone, in this video we are going to break down every source of nightmarish mysteries, starting from the very beginning. Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Did you know there's a book? Well, a poem really, and you probably did, but regardless, we're going to have a look. And also, and also, the biggest hidden gem, Jack is a father? Oh, where to begin? Yeah, did you know that our beloved Bone Daddy could really be, well, a Bone Daddy? As in a father to skeleton children's. From the movie, it's pretty clear that Jack Skellington is quite popular with everyone. Oh, Jack, you make wounds ooze and flesh crawl. He even sings about how he can scare the pants off of anyone. Okay, maybe I took that one a bit out of context. Yet even still, he didn't know about kissing until his adventures into Christmastown? Once Cat's out of the bag on that one, maybe he and Sally just went nuts. It could make sense that he would have had offspring eventually. There's just that teeny tiny matter of the life dampening nature of Halloween Town itself that gets in the way of that, but more on that in a bit though. Now, since Nightmare came out, there have been expansions to the lore and to the world in the form of a prequel, Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Pumpkin King, which takes place earlier in the timeline before the movie, and a sequel, Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge, which takes place after the movie events in the timeline and where Jack defends his Pumpkin King title from Oogie Boogie yet again, and a few illustrated gems and stories as well. But today, we're going to look at the poem that started it all, which later turned into a book illustrated by Tim Burton and published in September of 1993. I'm using the 20th anniversary edition, by the way, and another very important little forgotten lore gem. The original poem is a sort of twist on The Night Before Christmas poem and was originally intended to be a sort of short 4TV little holiday special, and not the longer movie we have today. It was a short poem written by Tim Burton, which was later turned into a book illustrated by him. Now, we have sort of a chicken and the egg problem with the illustrations. Which ones were Burton's before production of the movie, and which ones were illustrated after the movie was in a near final form for the express purpose of the book and influenced by the movie? Many of Burton's drawings and sensibilities appear in the movie, which was directed by Henry Selleck, who also has some awesome style. Because I tend to overanalyze, everything, I did write many, many more pages for this video comparing the book illustrations to what ultimately ends up in the movie, but because I cannot know for sure which drawings came first in each instance, I feel uncomfortable doing that literal comparison without all the facts. I hope you understand, and if you do know which drawings came when, I am so interested. Please let me know in the comments. Thank you! All that said, we are now going to dive into the poem text and sometimes visuals versus the movie. The brevity of the original vision and nature of poem in mind, I find it interesting to see just what was kept, what was changed, and what was fleshed out more to make a fuller length animation along the way. Before getting in too deep, there are some differences between the original 1993 edition of the poem book and the 20th anniversary edition, which I'll bring up again during our analysis as relevant. Generally, typesetting, font, and placement of text versus illustration are different between the versions, like the text and images switch pages left and right. Older text is sometimes on the images themselves, and some text appears grouped together on different pages entirely. Some illustrations that were full page in the 1993 edition are now windowed, and some that were windowed in the old version are now full page in the new version. The 20th anniversary edition has new illustrations and, I think, reworkings of some of the older sketchy ones. The story does not change, we just get some more illustrations. But because I'm looking at text primarily, I guess none of this really matters? Okay, into it. No Halloween, Halloween festivities to kick things off here. The book starts out late one fall in Halloween land, with Jack Morose alone and bemoaning the lack of something new, a silhouette in a full yellow moon on the iconic spiral hill jack-o'-lanterns below. This feels very similar to the movie. The poem mentions and shows Jack's signature bat bow tie, so that's a Burton original, and then Zero, who does have the glowing jack-o'-lantern nose, but who emerges from a slightly different looking tombstone. Jack, feeling empty, wanders into the forest, which looks just like the movie Hills and Trees, accompanied by Zero and a jack-o'-lantern sunshine, which is also in the movie. He stumbles upon three massive doorways carved in wood. Now, the text does not mention what the doorways are, but the accompanying illustration shows them to be a heart, a tree, and a painted egg. This is 
different than the movie, which opens with seven doors representing US secular holidays as well as commercially popular Christian holidays. In the movie, they don't seem to be in calendar order in their circle arrangement, so not quite a wheel of the year ordeal, that's eight by the way. The poem only has three doors, maybe to keep the scope small? Anyway, we're going to reference these trees again in the later part of the video, so stay sharp. Jack opens one special door to a white, windy flurry, just like the flakes from the movie. An illustration of him falling to a very similar portal as the movie and then pull up! He's in Christmas Town! I like to think that this book Pumpkin Man influenced this movie Jack Snowman here, but chicken and the egg! It's cute all the same. Just like in the movie, Jack is delighted by this new world and steals everything that glows so his friends won't think he's a liar. My favorite from the poem that is not in the movie, Jack steals the letter C from the Christmas Town sign, making it Hismas Town, like a snake. He also swipes all other odds and ends in the complete opposite spirit of the winter holiday. He steals from people too, stockings full of presents, candy, toys, a picture of Santa and the elves, lights, ornaments, snow, and even the main star from the tree. In the movie, he steals quite a lot more, including a vehicle to tow everything back home. He also presents his findings at a town hall type meeting as well, and the citizens gathered do look quite familiar, although if they were drawn after or during the movie, that's probably why. Amid many sheet ghosts, I see the witches, a Dr. Finkelstein looking bean in their Sally type construct, the devil, corpse kid, werewolf, tearaway face, clown, vampire, sackman, hey and someone that looks like the mayor. Jack's obsessive experimental phase lasts only one page in the book. This is something that was much, much more elaborate in the animation and honestly some of my favorite scenes. That snowflake was so cool. Anyway, in the book, the trick-or-treaters kidnap Santa next page. The poem describes them as weird little creatures in strange disguise. They were altogether ugly and rather petite. So not quite the details of Lock, Shock, and Barrel, although the drawing here looks very close to the scene from the movie. In the 20th anniversary edition, we get to see the familiar faces of Lock, Shock, and Barrel in a spot on the page opposite. They don't accidentally bring the Easter Bunny. Anyway, Jack introduces Santa Claus, not Sandy Claus, to the citizens of Halloween Land and then, like the movie, just sort of states that he is going to be Santa-ing this year. Oh, and Santa can just lay in Jack's coffin and yell boo. Zero gets to be a hero in the original poem too. A nasty fog rolls in and Zero saves the day, or night. In the movie, Sally tries a last ditch effort to keep Jack from flying off and uses her super hidden secret stash of fog juice to thwart the mission. Same result, fog for Zero to shine so bright in. The poem absolutely makes reference to Jack's coffin sleigh and skeleton deer, and the accompanying illustration looks so close to the shot in the movie, it's scary. The toys that Jack bestows are very close to what ended up in the movie. While we don't have a making Christmas song and scenes in the poem, we do have a vampire teddy bear with very sharp teeth, a monstrous train with tentacle tracks, and a man-eating plant disguised as a wreath. Note, the wreath illustration was not in the 1993 version of the book that I know of, but it is drawn in the 20th anniversary edition, and still looking hungry. Also, bonus poem toys! A baby doll possessed by a demon, a ghoulish puppet wielding an axe, and a Gumby and Pokey from the grave? An illustration present that is not explicitly mentioned in the text, the cat Jack in the Box, which is in the movie. Just like in the movie, Jack mistakenly thinks the missile's celebratory fireworks and gets blasted out of the sky, says Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night, after being shot down, landing in a graveyard to have a good cry. He is much more melodramatic in the movie, but we don't have time for that in a short poem, so anyway, Santa somehow meets him in the graveyard, gently scolds him, and then sets off to make Christmas right. Jack does not have to save Santa and Sally from Uki, but regardless, Santa brings Christmas to Halloween. Taking the poem as written text by itself, what bringing Christmas to the land of Halloween means is open to interpretation. Presents? Candy? But if you look at it in combination with the illustration, it means snow. Snow means Christmas, I guess. Anyway, look at that hill! Look at this shot! Chicken or egg? Egg or chicken? They look so similar! Cool! This is the end of the poem, but in the movie, with this snowfall, every citizen now finally understands the wonder that Jack was trying to impart. Guess all he really wished for was snow in Autumn Land, so climate change? Does this whole planetary mess have to do with Jack Skellington's meddling in other holidays? Kidding, of course, it's irresponsible to blame fictional characters for real world problems. Anyway, the end! In both the poem and the animation, Jack has a mid-afterlife crisis? Mid-death crisis. The story beats stay mostly intact between them, even if the poem is more of a literal skeleton <laughs> of a story. Sorry. 
The animation is so much richer. Characters, songs, world building, romance betrayal, super spooky science, a buggy villain, and even a redemption arc. Because it could be, and because it had to be. In the poem, we never see how Christmas was made right. But for the movie, Selleck made sure all the creepy macabre toys were replaced with happy, age-appropriate ones. Another change that was made to make the movie less nightmarish? The clown with the tearaway face originally had a really bloody and awful face beneath, but that was deemed too rough. So it ended up being the super not nightmare-inducing gaping hole of void with a deep disembodied voice instead. So that was all fun, but my most recent obsession with Nightmare came from inside a bargain bin. From a gem in a jewel case, and it takes place many years later in the movie game lore timeline. Story time! Hang in real tight and buckle up because we need to take two quick memory lane detours. I saw Nightmare in theaters when it first came out. Should I have been there? Probably not. But you see, my uncle was a Christmas fanatic. He was the jolliest guy and even had Santa's belly and bowl of jelly laugh. Needless to say, if there was a Christmas movie playing, we had to see it. And Nightmare Before Christmas has Christmas in the title, so you know we were there. He had no clue what it was about beforehand and also had the unfortunate habit of falling asleep two minutes into the trailers. So, baby me, face to face with deathly specters, skinless skeletons, and the literal stuff of nightmares, thinking, what? is this. So much of myself was formed that day and I didn't even realize it. I must have blacked out most of it after watching the film, but avoiding that under the bed monster and staffing worked their way into my unconscious daily quirks for years. But I always remembered Oogie Boogie bugging out. I think I vomited a bit, but I couldn't tear my eyes from the screen. That little bit has stayed with me for decades and forever, will I imagine? Anyway, all of that to say, I was a baby and had zero purchasing power for extras when the movie came out, and I was unaware of the extras too. Flash forward to this very spooky season, and I'm perusing the bookstore like you do, gathering up literary treasures when I get a funny feeling to check the CDs. When was the last time I even bought a CD? Heck if I know. I had no idea what I was searching for, but I knew when I found it. Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas original soundtrack from 1993 with all the original printed materials. I popped that puppy into the car CD player so fast, I paid for it first, I am no longer a baby, and expected to start singing along, but no! There was an opening that is not quite the poem I knew, read by none other than Sir Patrick Stewart. A trick? No, a treat! Then of course all the movie songs and scores, but then something in the closing, also read by Stewart, made me stop 30 feet before a stop sign. Jack has kids. What? I'll tell you the lines in just a second, but there is no transcript of them online that I've found so far. Even in the original soundtrack CD jewel case with all the original booklets and materials intact, there is no transcript of Stewart's lines. All of the song's lyrics are printed, but not this mysterious opening and closing. Imagine a wistful, reminiscing Santa figure saying the lines, I'm still rather fond of that skeleton man. So many years later, I thought I'd drop in. And there was old Jack still looking quite thin, with four or five skeleton children at hand playing strange little tunes in their xylophone band. I saw two paths before me, and I strayed out of thought and time. Pumpkins wheeled overhead, and every second was as long as the life age of the earth. Then I snapped out of it, finished the drive home, and have been obsessing about those lines ever since. I see two possibilities here. One, those skeletons are from the hanging tree, just chillin' and fillin' the downtime between Halloweens with some beats. Jack clearly likes to sing, Nightmare is a musical after all, maybe they have their own spooky band. They seem like smaller skeletons compared to super tall Jack in the movie, maybe giving off the appearance of children, or two, these skeletons are Jack's offspring, as it were. But for this to be the case, major workarounds must have been in place. For Halloween Town is in a perpetual state of frozen decay. What do I mean by that? Nothing grows, nothing dies, but everything just is in a limbo state. Autumn is my favorite time of year, but peak season only really lasts one week. Why? The things I like best are those same things in transition. Leaves changing, crops ripening. What was growing all summer is now going back to seed, decaying, rotting, back to the earth. It's a tricky time, blink and you'll miss it. Halloween Town, however, has the best the season has to offer without the fallout. It's like that perfect autumn week, frozen in time. The pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns don't seem to rot, no leaves grow or fall. We don't see the beginnings of growing things, or their endings. Halloween Town is like a single moment in time, but time absolutely passes as we can see by the moon phases, which is full on Halloween, then a crescent, then full near Christmas, 
and by the constant turning of the clocks in both Halloween and Christmas towns. But nothing seems to age. Deadly poison doesn't kill, and that's not for Sally's lack of trying. Deadly nightshade just wears off Dr. Finkelstein. No one dies here. They joke about it, use I hope he hasn't died as a colloquialism, but nothing does. Nothing decays either, it seems. Perpetually dead and dried thistles make a few appearances throughout the movie, the ones that give Sally her premonition and then later are used for her own petal divinations. But they're never fresh thistles. I think things are not born. That seems like more of a spring holiday theme anyway. They just are. I think the corpse children are always corpse children and always will be corpse children. Dr. Finkelstein can animate piles of bones and whatever Sally is made of, fabric and stuffing? But I think nothing new is organically made. It seems to me that the only way to create new life and break this non-cycle is through Dr. Finkelstein's machinery. The citizen count of Halloween Town does not seem to go up, even though Jack is popular in a wow wow way with many citizens. Not to put that all on Jack, just saying there is clearly a drive alive in town. Sally also has a thirst for him and they do share a connection. I'm going to posit that Jack and Sally are in fact spending their eternity together, now and forever. Maybe they eventually wanted kids. Physically, I don't know how that would work between a presumably seedless skeleton and a stuffing filled zone marble. I mean, I guess Jack does have bone eyelids. Anything is possible, I suppose. But most importantly, I don't think new life can grow organically in Halloween Town. My thoughts are that Dr. Finkelstein and Sally mended their bridges, or the doctor was so taken with himself 2.0 that he was happy to help, or Jack, as the Pumpkin King, decreed it. But in any case, Dr. Finkelstein used his tech to build and electrify some odd podge piles of bones to life, like he did the reindeer, and voila! Eureka! Baby bone daddies! But oh no, we are not quite done with this Halloween and Christmas time Easter egg hunt! We know in the book that there were three doors, and seven in the movie. However, from the closing, we have evidence that the other holidays had no clue of each other's existence before Jack's meddling. Post Jack, according to the closing, but after that night, things were never the same. Each holiday now knew the other one's name. So all seven tree holidays now know about the others. My brain is on fire imagining all those crossovers. After the many years have passed, original soundtrack Santa visits Jack and asks if he would redo his past Christmas takeover. Think carefully, Jack. Would you do the whole thing over again? Knowing then what you know now. Knowing now what you knew then. And he smiled like the old pumpkin king that I knew, then turned and asked softly of me. Wouldn't you? <laughs> Nostalgic multi-holiday swap in the works! And finally, something the Coraline fans out there probably have already gobbled up. Selick used Jack's head as well, not an Easter, but in an egg in Coraline. Mmm, bet that other mother meal was particularly high in calcium. Anyway, after digging up this jewel case gem of a treasure, I think my world is a bit more complete. It fueled my overactive imagination just like the movie did back in the day. Although I'm way less afraid of the monsters than baby me was, I think. But speaking of monsters, everyone kinda just assumes that all of the residents of Halloween Town are dead. I'm not so sure. But in the case of Lock, Shock, and Barrel, things get tricky. So listen, everyone. I've got some theories so interesting they just might bring you glee. But first you'll have to follow me into a realm of tricks and treats and fiends. Are Lock, Shock, and Barrel the most terrifying being in all of Halloween Town? Or are they just mortal chaos incarnate? Are they one being with three conscious manifestations? Or <laughs> what? Yeah. Or something a bit closer to home? Let's play with a few fun concepts to figure out just what they are. Lock, Shock, and Barrel are really unique to me because they don't seem to quite fit in with the rest of Halloween Town in a certain sense. Some of the residents there are quite obviously dead. Looking at you, ghosts, corpse mom, dad, and kid, and Halloween Town is their limbo-esque afterlife. Most of the other citizens are the traditional spooky monsters we know and love. We've got werewolves, vampires, swamp creatures, skeletons, understairs and bed monsters, devils, witches, and on and on. I'm not so certain they're in Halloween Town because they've died, but more so because they are spooky, still mortal, and or undead souls, and Halloween Town is where they choose to reside. I mean, why not? It's perfect. Enter in Lock, Shock, and Barrel, who it's easy to assume are dead and now linger at the age they passed, but spookier. Ooh. But I'm not so sure. Let's play Alive or Not, Departed Fiend or Mortal Edition. First up, Locke, who looks like he could have froze to death, judging by his cold-looking blue lips. 
or he could be a real-life devil and not dead with his spiky hair horns, and is that a real tail or part of a costume? Well, that leads us to his other layer of identity with the devil masking costume. So, the results are undecided. We could say that poor old Beryl, who seems to be the guinea pig in a lot of dangerous tricks, died as a result of these same type of tricks in his previous life. I'm not exactly sure what traditional spooky thing he's supposed to be. And he dresses as a skeleton, but he has a permanent creepy grin, sunken eyes, and manic panic green hair, so he kind of exists on the edge of all three. Afterlife dweller, unknown creepy spooky, and maybe mortal. And then, of course, we've got Clever Shock, who I think got her cooler than stock name, hang on, we'll get there, because she either is a young witch who dabbles in lightning magicka spells, is she a weather witch, or just likes to dress like one. Maybe an experimenter potion went wrong, sending her to an early demise, but she doesn't strike me as one who passed and doesn't quite fit the afterlife mold. So this whole game is kind of a bust, but we need it for reference later in the video. There is one possibility that could explain why the devious trio, Lock, Shock, and Barrel, are not only so close, but also so singly devoted to the chaos that is Oogie Boogie. And for that, we again need to look at what traditional boogeymen or sack men did, which is wait around to the dead of night and capture misbehaving children, throw them into a sack, take them somewhere, do whatever Lock, Shock, and Barrel sing about doing to Sandy Claus, or you know, just off them. Now, as we'll find out in the next segment, Oogie Boogie is an anti-traditional boogeyman. He has some backstory that's filled in by all the Nightmare Before Christmas video games. But to keep it simple, maybe if slash when Oogie Boogie made the transition from real world to holiday realm life, he also changes in nature to be more bug focused instead of child focused. And also maybe there are not that many kids to nap in Halloween Town on a nightly basis, so bugs it is. But regardless, what if Oogie Boogie in his pre-Halloween Town traditional Sackman life captured Lock, Shock, and Barrel and, um, ended it for them, if you think Halloween Town is inhabited by the dead, or just took them with him, if you think anything spooky can choose to reside in the town? And then they, as a matter of course, develop this warped, parasitic, fear-based, but still need to impress Oogie Boogie and stay on his good side relationship. Now, getting back to their single-mindedness when it comes to chaos. Maybe a clue is in the phrase their names are derived from. Lock, stock, and barrel is a loaded <laughs> phrase that came about around 1817, so you know, super new and trendy. The phrase itself is a merism, or that's a linguistic phenomenon in which a combination of two or more contrasting parts of the whole refer to the whole. For example, in order to say that someone searched everywhere, one could use the merism, searched high and low. Totality is expressed by contrasting parts. Thank you, Wikipedia. Basically, the phrase tries to convey everything by listing the opposites in its description, and we fill in the gaps to get the scale of what it's conveying. Now, if we applied this particular usage to lock, shock, and barrel, things get muddy. Well, it's straightforward to be the exact opposite of one thing, being the exact opposite of two things simultaneously gets confusing. It's like playing rock, paper, scissors with three people. For a winning condition, the two losing players have to show identical in order for one winner to reign supreme by showing their opposite. Otherwise, it's a three-way draw or a two-way draw. And it kind of works for Lock, Shock, and Barrel as they are always vying with each other for the spotlight and have their plan chosen. Would this make Lock, Shock, and Barrel a constantly morphing to be in exact opposition constantly being? Terrifying! But fortunately, a mirrorism also works by counting off several of an object's more conspicuous, not necessarily opposite, parts to refer to the whole object. Totality is expressed by naming off the obvious complementary parts of an object. For example, hook, line, and sinker. The parts are not opposite, but separate, distinct parts of a fishing rod with their own distinct purpose and function. Lock, shock, and barrel's name is a play on lock, stock, and barrel, which are parts of a firearm. Maybe because they are the strong arm of Oogie Boogie's malice while he's trapped below the treehouse? So, from the mirrorism definition, Lock, Shock, and Barrel could each either be extreme opposites of a morphing trio or complementary parts of a trio. The latter makes sense here, the totality by distinct parts usage. But shoot, they kind of tell us they are three of a kind, birds of a feather, now and forever! La, 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 la. And they are known collectively as Oogie's Boys. I don't know, but that's what the mayor says. A singular identity made up of devil, witch, and a kinda skeleton. They're multiple individual identities. 
who are also disguised trick-or-treaters, another singular collective identity. That's their twist for spooking mortals on Halloween, sure, but it adds another layer to what makes them so unique. Now, if Lock, Shock, and Barrel being a creepy, not quite hive mind, but singular purpose now and forever, undying being with three physical manifestations seems like a bit of a stretch, it is. But I had to go there because what if? They would be the most terrifying entity in Halloween Town with the sheer chaos they sow, the high strung, never diminishing energy, and their penchant for death inducing stunts. Anyway, moving on to my favorite theory, which I must confess I have saved for the last, for it kind of breaks a lot of bounds. For you see, what if Lock, Shock, and Barrel are not dead at all, not traditional resident spooky city dwellers, but regular kids who like spooky things and just can't be bothered with the real mundane world anymore? Hear me out. They don't seem dead to me like others there. They are not your traditional spookies unless you count an inverse boogeyman as their collective gimmick and identity. They seem to me like regular kids who love pranking, love dressing up, and love living in a spooktacular Never Neverland treehouse. Never growing up or whatever because of the perpetual state of frozen, timeless decay that pervades Halloween Town. So, how did this happen? How do mortal kids find this magical realm of Halloween Town? Well, for starters, the trees seem to be just hanging out in a forest. They are accessible from every holiday land, and Lock, Shock, and Barrel seem like they knew where to set off to when Jack asked them to go to the tree doors to the different realms. Yeah, they mess it up at first, but for all we know, they seem to have known where they were going generally. Just couldn't remember the right shape, dang it. One issue for me with this is they seem like the type of pranksters who would run amok in all the other holidays, causing massive chaos and confusion with pranks if they knew how to reach them before Jack told them about the doors. Or not, maybe they just like Spooky Land exclusively. Heck, I would. Now here's where things get real world bending fun. Lock, Shock, and Barrel could have found another entrance to Halloween Town through one of the many gravesite passages. Apparently, those are everywhere, as when Jack crash lands into a random cemetery, he is able to open up a grave and poof, he's back home in good old Halloween Town. And unless this tomb door to Halloween Town is a Pumpkin King exclusive power, Lock, Shock, and Barrel strike me as the type of pranksters who would spend a lot of time exploring graveyards and cemeteries for funsies, just hanging out and vibing or pranking and spellcasting as you do. If they spent so long in a cemetery, odds are they would have also found a door like the one Jack used, opened it, explored it, and found the spooky land of their perpetual Halloween dreams. Or followed after him one Halloween night, which would explain their costumes. To me, this fits. Halloween Town is like Never Never Land for spooky souls, and Lock, Shock, and Barrel can hang out there like the Lost Boys and also Lost Girl Shock in Peter Pan, never growing up, always causing trouble, and annually crossing into the mortal world for some trick-or-treat tricks. It's just a tombstone away, after all. So, Lock, Shock, and Barrel. Are they Sackman victims spending their eternal slumber awake and running amok in Halloween Town, growing in power? Are they supernatural beings in their own right, either connected as a single terrifying marismic entity or just best devil, witch, and uh, barrel friends united in chaos? Or are they simply mortal prankster children with spooky souls who stumbled upon the realm of their wildest dreamy nightmares and decided to stay there forevermore? This world may never know, but let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm uh, gonna go for a walk in a cemetery, I guess. Looking for some shortcut. <laughs> so now that Lock, Shock, and Barrel are sort of sorted, it's time to unravel the Oogie Boogie Man. Let's dive into the real life creepy origins of one of the most unsettling characters in The Nightmare Before Christmas. Well, 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 what have we here? Oogie Boogie, huh? Ooh, I'm full of fear. You know him. You most likely grew up with stories and ominous promises of them nabbing you in the dead of night if you misbehaved during the day. Into the sack you go, mwahaha. I say you probably did because turns out most everywhere in the world has a boogeyman or sackman or similar entity of its own. And maybe that's why the Nightmare Before Christmas's Oogie Boogie strikes such a terrifying collective chord. Oogie Boogie is so frightening because he is a blank campus. <laughs> Get it? Because presumably he's a burlap sack? <sighs> Sorry. 
for each person to project their own fears onto. He is unpredictable and chaotic and an exact anti -class. Also, his makeup is extremely confusing. So join me as I confront some early cinematic trauma and attempt to unravel one of the most interesting and unsettling characters in The Nightmare Before Christmas. The Oogie Boogie Man. Wow. He is the shadow of the moon that night, filling your dreams to the brim with fright. And he was not in the original Nightmare Before Christmas book and poem in this final form, but we'll get to that in a bit. You're either indifferent to him, love him, or he just really bugs you for some reason. Most everywhere under the sun, or under the shadow of the moon at night, has experiences and stories relating to a boogeyman or sackman of sorts. Just do a basic Google search and wham, isn't that Wikipedia page something? Wow. Most every continent, culture, and country has a version of the kidnapping boogeyman, and of course, what those entities actually do varies from culture to culture. Some hide in the shadows or under the beds of children ready to steal them in the dead of night. Others eat their victims after carrying them away in a sack or drowning them in a wash tub? Hmm, interesting. Still another licks the feet of its victims so they cannot flee. Some are legless ghosts, others are ape-like apparitions, and some are even large bugs. <laughs> Basically everything Lock, Shock, and Barrel sing about doing to Santa Claus. The list goes on and on and is sure to send a shiver or few down your spine. The sack man is of particular interest here. This is a man with a sack on his back who carries naughty children away. And Nightmare Before Christmas kind of turns the sack man on its head. The Nightmare Before Christmas's Oogie Boogie is quite complex, but he was not in Tim Burton's original book slash poem beyond a background filled character shape. He was introduced as a villain for the film to allow bony old Jack a redemption arc of sorts, you know, some character growth. Book Jack is a malaise, kind of selfish guy who fails at taking over a holiday and is still rewarded with powder everywhere, snow. Jack does not have to risk anything to save the Jolly Santa Claus and or confront Oogie Boogie. But all that being said, now that Oogie Boogie is here as an antagonist in the movie, I can't help but see how much he is extremely like an anti -claus. Which is probably the point. Oogie and Santa are like two sides to the same coin, and that really comes through in their duet in Oogie's, uh, fun room? One begs to be set free in order to make kids happy, the other just wants to have some selfish fun. One rewards nice little children for good behavior with a toy from their endless sack, and the other would traditionally punish naughty kids by tossing them into their bottomless sack. Where Sandy Claus is busy going through the list of nice children to reward with presents out of his infinite sack of joy, Oogie employs the naughtiest of kids to kidnap the Sandy Claus, which I know Jack assigns them, but these finger-crossing fiends think only of chaos and Oogie Boogie, really. Lock, Shock, and Barrel, the henchmen or Oogie's boys, are the very naughty kids traditional boogeyman kidnap in sacks and such. When we first meet Lock, Shock, and Barrel, they are pelting the poor mayor with slingshot projectiles for heck's sake. But yeah, Oogie Boogie is not only an anti claus for seeking out the naughty children, but he's also a kind of anti boogeyman too. Hear me out. Rather than eating them, punishing them, or doing whatever traditional boogeymen do, Oogie Boogie employs the misbehaving rascals to bring him sustenance in order to increase his powers. He's not a threat to naughty children, but their patron, I guess? And that may be because he's trapped on there, so they may have developed a symbiotic relationship or something? Anyway. Oogie doesn't get much screen time in the film until about 48 minutes into the 118 minute animation. This leaves a lot to the overactive imagination, so when we finally do see him, he makes that much more of an impact. Something that has always bugged me <laughs> about Oogie Boogie. He is made of bugs, snakes, spiders, scorpions, you name it. Yet his snake and spider stew is infamous and a prospective reward for his henchmen. Does he put his own body bugs into the mix, or does he add new ones, like the special deliveries down the chute, and cook those before ingesting them via the stew? Is he made up only of the bugs he eats after cooking them, or after the henchmen dip them in poison so I guess they are reanimated corpses? Does that make him really just a sack of burlap, a literal sack man? Dun dun dun. Or is he a hive mind of bugs acting as one entity? 
When he unravels and loses bug after bug, which freaked me out as a kid, but hey, major kudos to the animation team who spent so long on that scene, his voice breaks down, multiplies, and gets higher pitched until it seems that he is just the one itty bitty boogie bug that gets squashed. So, are we to think that this little bug is so charismatic that all the other bugs just want to join up? Uh, but what about that bug from earlier that was super scared? I feel like it was very reluctant to join Oogie Boogie's body bugs. So what magic is binding and compelling the minds and bodies of these bugs together? My hunch is that it's the boogie bag. I think that this buggy oogie is nothing more than an enchanted bag or sack and that this is hinted at in the intro to the movie when the voice says, I in the shadow of the moon at night, feeling your dreams to the brim with fright. Bats form from its shape and fly out from its mouth, and the shadow face dissolves to nothingness at the same time. This is eerily similar to what actually happens later in the movie. The bag rips and the bugs pour out and Oogie Boogie dissolves to nothingness. Super foreshadowing of the shadow of the moon at night, or just a spooky cool transition? Hmm. And that's some many-legged food for thought. It also sheds some light onto Uki's seemingly chaotic desire to ingest Sandy Claws. He wants to use him to add a little spice to his snake and spider stew, after all. By adding Sandy Claws to his sentient sack body, he could become more powerful. <laughs> Which actually brings us to the Nightmare Before Christmas video games. Oogie Boogie was around and already ordering about Lock, Shock, and Barrel in the video game prequel, The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Pumpkin King, which came out after the movie but takes place the year before it. Here, Oogie lives in the familiar treehouse and is decreed to dwell below it forevermore when, spoiler, Jack defeats him, foils Oogie's Crawloween dreams, and claims the familiar Pumpkin King title for himself. From this, we know that Oogie Boogie is bug-focused and already an anti-traditional boogeyman of sorts, as Lock, Shock, and Barrel are his employees. In the sequel video game, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge, which takes place the year after the movie, Lock, Shock, and Barrel are so bored that they revive Oogie Boogie. How they do this, I don't know, but it seems like an extremely important key to figuring out just what makes up Oogie Boogie. Did they retrieve the sack that ripped off? Ah, well, that's just something that we cannot grasp. Anyway, to make short of it, Oogie Boogie wants to become the Seven Holidays King and kidnaps all the holiday leaders. He is thwarted when he falls into a world of garbage and absorbs the waste and insects into himself, powering him up for battle. This confirms to me that Oogie Boogie is actually a magical sack that gains power from whatever it ingests. A literal sack man. A man made from an enchanted sack and whatever that sack contains. And to me, that's all really fascinating. Like all this power. The overpower power to absorb what he eats, beyond nutritional content of course. The power to keep ingested creatures alive or reanimate them in his sack body. The confusing Luigi's Mansion Poltergust wind tunnel breath power. And especially the power to keep people quaking in fear without leaving his treehouse basement. All add up to make Oogie Boogie one of the most interesting characters in The Nightmare Before Christmas to me. Also, the bugs. All those bugs made a lasting impression for decades. But this is now the end of our Oogie Boogie song. What are some of your thoughts? What are some of the boogeyman stories you grew up hearing about? Go ahead and fill our dreams to the brim with frights and tell all about them in the comments below. I had no plans to sleep like ever again. <laughs> and you might not sleep either after this spooky take on who actually runs things in the land of Halloween. Halloween Town in the Nightmare Before Christmas is an interesting place. There's ghosts and ghouls and witches scattered all around, but the sense of hierarchy is all over the place as well. Is it more important to be the Pumpkin King or the Mayor? The realm of Halloween extends far beyond the small town we know it for, too. So could there be someone else above these two individuals? Let's talk about that. When Jack Skellington stumbles into Christmas Town, it's very clear that the head of the holiday is Santa Claus, er, Sandy Claus, of course. Everything sort of revolves around this jolly red fellow, so it's obvious who sort of pulls the strings and calls the shots. But we'll come back to this in a moment. In the world of Halloween Town, things seem a bit different. Perhaps it's just that we have a more in-depth look at the town as a whole, but there's a definite power dynamic between the mayor and Jack Skellington. Jack is the crowd favorite. Everyone knows him and most people look up to him, both literally and figuratively. He is very tall. The Pumpkin King seems to be a title that carries great respect, 
considering that jack-o'-lanterns are super symbolic of Halloween. They embody the concept of the harvest time and the spooky season completely. After the death and rebirth ceremony, everybody congratulates Jack and can't wait for next year. Through the course of the movie, then Jack obsessively tries to combine Christmas and Halloween to make the ultimate showcase for next Halloween. That is, before he tries to ambitiously usurp Christmas. And everyone runs with his wild ideas, no questions asked. For everything, he acts as the leader of the festivities. And obviously by the name Pumpkin King, this makes sense. But a leader of All Halloween Town could conflict with the role of mayor, who seems to be the one who actually governs the one town we know exists in the realm of Halloween. For as popular as Jack is, the mayor still is popular himself as he is an elected official, a person selected by the community to keep the entire town running smoothly. Some majority had to vote for him. Now, the mayor is a role that actually didn't exist in the original poem book, at least in terms of a direct callout. A character that looks like the movie mayor is there in the pages, but they are never mentioned by title, merely a visual part of the Christmas show-and-tell scene. Given how Halloween Town has one character that everyone admires and so does Christmas Town, perhaps each has one spiritual being that is the focal or feeling of the holiday. Jack is the true Halloween king, and the mayor runs the society underneath him. In Christmas Town, this role seems to be Sandy, Santa, and perhaps it's another individual's responsibility to run the town and keep toy production on track. My bet's on Mrs. Claus to keep that ship running. This seems pretty balanced. Perhaps the same setup exists in other holiday doors, like Easter, assuming a society is formed there. Just imagine little bunnies and little chicks all over the place. Aww. But there's one thing that sort of makes me question this hierarchy. And it wasn't something I really paid attention to until I was analyzing individual frames of the movie for my Finkelstein's first monster video. Most of the time, we are focused on the foreground in movies, unless the background is deliberately made a focal point. So it's easy to miss things lurking there. But this thing is a big one. In the opening scene of The Nightmare Before Christmas, during the Halloween parade, there are a lot of characters that we don't get to see in the actual movie. One such is Frankenstein's monster, which is something I touched on in a separate video, and is pretty interesting given that Finkelstein exists. But something way more intriguing than Frankenstein's monster existing in this universe is a certain cloaked figure lurking around the town, slipping in and out of the shadows, hiding in the darkness. The Grim Reaper themselves, death. And this character really throws a wrench into things. It'd be easy to write the character off as an easter egg like Frankenstein's monster, given its quick inclusion in the parade as a non-focal point. But unlike Frankenstein's monster, this isn't the only time this character appears. They also appear at the Town Hall Christmas show and tell meeting that Jack calls once he returns from Christmastown. The Grim Reaper can be seen lingering in the back of the room, which is super appropriate as death is sort of a looming inevitable thing for everything alive. It makes sense that the embodiment of death would choose an obscure, out-of-sight, and almost out-of-mind seat. However, the fact that death chose to attend this hints at something more. The Grim Reaper has stake in this town, and it really makes me wonder how they fit into this world. The Grim Reaper, or Death Personified, is a skeletal figure clothed in black robes believed to be funerary attire during some of the worst bouts of the Black Plague and carrying a scythe, used in agriculture to harvest a crop or cut it down in preparation for the next season. Extremely metaphorical for death. The Grim Reaper is one of many iconic personifications for death, which, in some cultures, comes to collect a person's soul as they pass on. Sometimes they are cloaked, sometimes not. But death has been around in some depiction as long as beings have been living, and of course, dying. The Grim Reaper is a psychopomp, from the Greek word meaning guide of souls that escorts newly deceased souls from earth to the afterlife. They are not a judge, merely an escort to whatever is beyond. And in theme with Halloween, many believe that the veil separating the realms of the living and the realm beyond is at its thinnest during Halloween. Since death has the ability to appear by someone during their final moments, it would be safe to assume they don't need a door to travel between the human world and Halloween town. Even if more doors exist, as is hinted at by Jack traveling to Halloween Town through a graveyard, death would seemingly need to traverse in a multitude of places near instantaneously. So the fact that they showed up for a meeting to hear about Jack's cross-world adventure shows that perhaps there is concern. We don't know if death brings the deceased to Halloween Town by acting as a guide like we discussed earlier, so perhaps Jack's meddling is sort of throwing off the balance of the world in some regard. 
which could explain why death pays him a visit. Of course, this is all just fun speculation, like maybe the Grim Reaper was an easy to reuse character model, but it brings me back to that sense of hierarchy again. At the foundation, you have the normal residents of a holiday world, like the townsfolk of Halloween Town. Above them, you have the elected official who keeps things running smoothly. Above that, you'd have the holiday spirit, whether Sandy Claus, Jack Skellington, or the Easter Bunny, whoever brings both the spark and theme to the land. And above that, you have the spirits like death that are involved in all different worlds. That is, unless Jack isn't really the true figure that represents Halloween. I mean, it's known that Oogie Boogie had plans to be the new spooky holiday leader. In the Game Boy Advance prequel game, The Pumpkin King, Oogie wants to usurp Halloween Town and make it a new holiday, New Bug Day, in Jack's absence. It's unclear if that position is one that was available for grabs, but Oogie certainly seemed to think that any holiday leader could be replaced if there was a vacancy. Given this, it looks like the role of Pumpkin King is something that can change over time, as attitudes and meanings of the season change for humankind. It isn't forever, nor is that being immortal. Heck, from Jack's lament, we know that in a million years they'll find him, only dust and a plaque that reads here lies poor old Jack. Jack is counting on not being alive, or maybe even perhaps relevant, so sad, in a million years, and all that will remain is what's written about him on the plaque. He will no longer be able to be an interactive spirit Pumpkin King. To support that, Jack Skellington maybe has children later on. If you missed that segment, I highly recommend checking it out. So if Jack could have children, then that could mean aging is possible for him. Otherwise, Halloween Town would get super crowded very fast. I suppose you could argue this not to be the case, but his children at some point have to grow up, maybe. The whole children concept comes from an encounter that Jack has with Sandy many years later after the events of Nightmare Before Christmas. But I digress. What if the Pumpkin King, the true king of Halloween, is supposed to be death? Ever present, never forgotten, undying death. A consistent icon ruling from the shadows. And because of death's extended absences in Halloween Town due to the never-ending responsibilities across all the world, Jack Skellington was the one to fill in for that role, an itinerant pumpkin king, for as long as he lasts. It would kind of make sense, given that Oogie Boogie sees it as a renameable position up for grabs, and it totally alters my perception of Halloween Town in The Nightmare Before Christmas. The true ruler of Halloween lingers in the shadows and only appears when it's time for a grand celebration, when the veil between the worlds of the living and the dead is at its thinnest, or when the balance of the world is out of whack and teetering towards peril when the holiday worlds collide. It's quite a lot to think about. But let me know your thoughts on this little but kind of big detail. Is the Grim Reaper the true ruler of Halloween Town, guiding it like death itself from the shadows, just out of sight? Okay, so now that we've talked about what the heck is Oogie Boogie, what are Lock, Shock, and Barrel, and who is really in charge of Halloween Town, it's time to take everything we've gleaned so far from the movie almost exclusively and add a whole bunch of new lore to it. <laughs> Seriously, I'm going to get into how Halloween Town is actually run more in depth than we've already covered, but first we need to absorb all the info we can from Sally's origin storybook. It's wild, so here we go! So there's this new Nightmare Before Christmas book about Sally, and of course I read it, and I have some thoughts and theories. It reveals a ton of what we've always speculated about Halloween Town and the other towns too, and Sally's true origin really blows things up like in galactic proportions. So of course with great revelations come a lot of spoilers. Consider this your warning, because of course I'm going to dissect this book like Jack Skellington obsessively dissecting Christmas. Now, the story itself is so charming, lovingly crafted, and full of sewing analogies, so kudos there. It takes place two weeks before Halloween, the year after Jack Skellington almost ruins Christmas. Sally is making her gothtastic wedding dress the night before her wedding to Jack. I appreciate the procrastinating crafting. And she's so grateful that she won't have to serve Dr. Finkelstein anymore. I am no longer your creation, she thinks. Like, hang on, we need to pick this apart. Clearly, I hope this is mind over matter, right? Dr. F has moved on and already created a version of himself to replace Sally. Does Sally feel she can only exist if she belongs to someone? Is this a function of her uh, programming? It saddens me that she feels her only options are staying with Dr. Finkelstein or else marrying, which is valid. But was there nothing else she wanted to do? I don't know, like open her own deadly apothecary or something? Sally, we find a few pages later, is plagued by extreme self-doubt for being just a ragdoll. <sighs> 
At first, all of this negative self-talk really upset me because Sally struggles with this for the first half of the book. But I stuck with it and her journey is, uh, interesting and rewarding to say the least. But I digress. When Jack and Sally get married on Spiral Hill, Sally inherits the title, The Pumpkin Queen. And the new couple set off on their one, one day honeymoon to Valentine's Town. Yay, we get to see what's behind the heart-shaped tree door! Now, this world is creepy because it's too perfect and sugary, and even has a half-price dentist office that I'm sure makes a killing from this world made of sugar and flowers. Everything in business revolves around Valentine's candy and poetry. It's cafes and bed and breakfasts and generally the perfect place for a honeymoon. Just be mindful of the stray packs of roaming flying baby cupids everywhere. Sally feels very unroyal after her meeting with the very poised and proper Queen Ruby Valentino. She's only had her title a few hours though, so give yourself a break, Sally! She tries to take a few flower petals home, but they wilt before she and Jack can go through the door. I'm gonna zip through this next part to get to the new tree door, yeah, but you need some basics. After returning from the honeymoon, Sally gets overwhelmed with the expectations from the townsfolk, understandably so. Tabloid photos organizing the Hallow's Eve party, her appearance picked apart, new crown, new clothes, new shoes that just all aren't her, and Jack's already preoccupied with the Halloween planning and kind of in his own zone. After one, one day of marriage in Queendom, Sally realizes that she has traded one prison for another. She needs quiet she needs to get away. So she heads to the hinterlands, to a new part of the forest, well, new to her, and far away from the known tree grove covered in vines is a new door, or a very ancient door. It has a blue crescent moon carved into the tree. Opening it makes Sally smell lavender and chamomile tea, feel her eyes becoming heavy, like death coins have been placed on them, and want to lay down on a mossy bed so comfy. Zero, however, pulls her arm off before she can slip any further into darkness, and she chases him away from the tree and to the graveyard to retrieve her arm. But something's wrong. Everything is quiet, just like she wanted. Lockshock and Barrel are passed out in a bathtub, faces strained in screams, coated in sand. Is an endless loose? Or did the Sleeping Beauty fairies do a number on Halloween Town because everyone is sleeping? Jack, the vampires, witches, everyone. Except for that stray black cat and Zero. And of course, the Sandman, who we're not supposed to know yet. A bearded old man thing dressed in clothes like clouds with heavy eyebrows and dark rimmed eyes, humming a lullaby as he creeps along the streets. The night is warm and drowsy and you must be tired, he crones. Step into the open and I will give you what you desire. I am not the thing you fear, he whispers now, which totally means he is the thing you fear. I am the giver of dreams, of riddles and lullabies and moonbeams. Apparently, Sally never closed the tree door and let the creature out of the unknown moon door. So, an open door is an open invitation to other door beings. Got it. This is important knowledge between realms. Sally barricades it shut with twigs, etc. to prevent future creatures from coming out, but kinda too late because, spoiler, every town is affected by the creature, and the human realm too. It's down to Sally to fix everything. After a run-in with the monster, where she gets coated in the sand too, but makes it through, she heads to the other realms to find answers. The book explores all the other towns and that's what I'm all about, so let's go travel! These doors are very American Christian specific and my hunch and hope is that in other places in the world the doors would be different, especially when we find out the big reveal. But first up is Valentine's Town, which we've already explored, and then Christmas Town, which we already know. Both rulers, Queen Ruby Valentino and Sandy Claus, are asleep, covered in sand. But new! Easter Town is next! It's a warm, spring-like forest where the grass is fake papery crunchy and, quote, dyed using pastel green clovers or swamp water. <laughs> like we're in an Easter basket. There are painted pastel eggs everywhere, which Sally is apprehensive of because surely if those were in Halloween Town, they would be full of awful pranks and probably smells. Anyway, Easter Town is not so much a town, but more of a meadow with rabbit warrens. There are no shops, buildings, or fountains, but there is a gazebo in the center, painted with tulips and daisies. Apparently, this is the spot where all the eggs get painted by rabbits, who are all frozen in terror, sleeping and covered in sand. The bigger Easter Bunny themselves is asleep on the steps leading up to the others, try to protect them. Oh. Okay, so now the turkey door to Thanksgiving Town. This realm is like Halloween Town, but a bit colder. Colorful leaves like sunset are still on the trees, which is odd because I thought the trees in Halloween Town were already bare. 
Anyway, it's farmland, corn, wheat, pumpkin crops with the scent of smoke rising up from the chimneys. The inhabitants are regular people, mooring, who I guess just eat all the time? Harvest and eat and repeat. One guy with a mustache and a pipe is asleep on his porch while his family is at dinner, slumped forward. Their soup and drinks are still steaming. They were mid-eating. Sand, of course, everywhere. There is a flock of wild turkeys running amok that were, I guess, fast enough to outrun the creature. But there are a lot of issues with this holiday and I think we should move on to Fourth of July town, where fireworks are still going off in the sky because freedom doesn't sleep, I guess. The inhabitants here also seem to be regular humans, but unlike America, everyone has a house with a clear dome so they can always see the fireworks going off. Yeesh. Their eyes are all wide open, staring above, sleeping, and of course, covered in sand. On to the four-leaf clover door. You probably know what's here. Sally finds a, quote, small forest, trees stunted and short with the air smells of moss and mint. Oh, and hops. Several paths lead away from the grove, going everywhere, but they all lead back to the grove. A trick to stop guests from finding the town, which seems at first promising as a way to avoid that creature. But by following her shadow, Sally makes it to the gold-hued gate carved with St. Patrick Town. Here, the houses are made of twigs with thatched roofs, half of Sally's size. Small red-bearded men and rosy women are all asleep in pubs and cafes and babies in moss cribs. One little man is still awake and looking for his treasure at the end of a rainbow. He's a leprechaun, of course, who tells Sally officially that the creature is the Sandman from an ancient realm. This guy knows about all the other doors and the ancient realms, so like, how do all the other residents of other towns seem to know about these other doors and worlds? Why is Halloween Town so isolated? Side jaunt from our travels to share some extremely important lore that Sally randomly remembers. Dr. Finkelstein has a book of folk tales and stories about, quote, ancient realms that had been forgotten, doorways that had been lost with time. <clears throat> important. She only got through a few pages before Finkelstein tells her she's more useful in the kitchen, jerk. Anyway, she connects the dots and realizes that the moon door must be one such ancient realm. And now we know that there are more realms. Cool, right? I mean, I guess we knew that Oogie Boogie's bug day had to come from somewhere, though. And then the leprechaun casually mentions that, quote, the ancient realms were around long before our holidays ever existed. Again, why does this guy know all about this, but Halloween Town is mostly aloof? He also says that to beat the Sandman, Sally needs to go into his realm, into Dream Town. Surely someone there knows how to bring the Sandman back to where he belongs. <laughs> I wish it were so easy. Anyway, he gives Sally a four-leaf clover and says one from St. Patrick Town is particularly lucky. I just hope it doesn't wilt before she gets to the exit like the Valentine's Town petals did, but they survive, so this may be a continuity error. Anyway, back in Halloween Town, Sally goes to the waning moon door with the silver knob, gets heavy-eyed, and starts for Dream Town, where the ground is soft and fleecy. It's not quite day, not quite night. It's twilight. White flowered trees sway hypnotically in a breeze. It's slightly warm and sounds also oh, cozy. Permanent twilight. A full moon hangs heavy in the sky to lull the weary to sleep. There's a quiet babbling brook. All the ASMR sounds. Fields and fields of just lavender. And people in the fields wearing striped, footed, and hooded soft pajamas, sleeping caps, and carrying candlesticks. This is just too cozy. They speak in riddles, rhymes, or bedtime stories. Unlike every other town, this one has a huge wall, kind of like Attack on Titan. The only way in is through heavy double doors with iron spikes on top, guarded by blue pajama men with shepherd crooks. They mean business and this is a well-guarded town, either keeping something out or in. Sally smells wood fire and clove scents, chamomile and jasmine teas. This town's honestly a close second to Halloween Town for me. At the center of town, the Lullaby Library building stands several stories tall and is full of people writing fairy tales and rhymes nightly for the mortals to fall asleep to. It's perfect! Sally gets summoned to the Governor's House, a white stone house with clouds purposefully gathered or placed around the top of it. This has floor-to-ceiling windows, rooms stuffed with pillows, blankets, fairy tales, etc. It's basically heaven. Now, here's a big spoiler. The governors of Dreamtown, Albert and Greta, are ragdolls, just like Sally and her parents. <laughs> yes, so she wasn't created in Finkelstein's lab and never should have felt like she belonged to him anyway, but this is why the Sandman's sand had no effect on her when she encountered him in Halloween Town. 
it doesn't affect the residents of Dreamtown. At first I thought, well, she's fallen asleep and she clearly dreamt this too-good-to-be-true situation up. But no, it's real. What's more, she was kidnapped by Finkelstein at age 12. Finkelstein, with his knowledge of the ancient realms we later learn, was looking to research Dream Sand, but instead saw Sally and wanted a daughter to mistreat. <laughs> but probably mostly wanted people to think that he created her so that they would respect his inventions more. I can't say I do now. He gave her a forgetting potion to wipe her memory. He also unstuffed all the cotton from her body that she was born with and filled it back up with leaves to make his deception more complete. Seriously, what a terrible being! The Dreamtown butler saw a pale-skinned man with an oversized head and pebble-eyed steal young Sally into the woods. Dr. Finkelstein didn't need the chair then, apparently, but he did block the door on the other side so no one could find Sally. Sally, now parented, encounters a counting sheep stampede. How cute! Everything about this town is just perfect. They show her her childhood garden where she used to grow Valerian and Night Jasmine. Oh, so on brand! There are other dolls, bunnies, teddy bears whose job it is to coax children to sleep, and they work around the clock because of the different time zones in the human world. Dreamtown's purpose is to put mortals to sleep, as you may have guessed. Now we get to that which must be guarded, the Dream Sand Factory. Made from stardust, moonbeams, and a pinch of yawns from the yawning tree that grows just outside of the town beyond the peat bog. <laughs> The walls around town are to keep the Sandman out of the factory. Cut off his supply of dream sand so he can stop stealing the dreams of every being he encounters. Look, there's quite a few plot issues with this and from this point on. We learn that the Sandman can float 20 or so feet off the ground. Why only 20? Well, the sand he carries weighs him down, so that's like an average float height. But he literally put the world to sleep, no one's waking up, and has sand to spare, so why they're obsessed with cutting off his supply? I don't know. Also, if he used all his sand, wouldn't he just hover higher than the wall because he's lighter now? So the wall's useless? Duh. All right, Sandman lore time! Apparently, the Sandman was the ruler of Dreamtown for a long time. Quote, he was cruel and greedy and we had to increase production of dream sand just to keep up. He stole millions of dreams every night. The poets were forced to write lullabies until their fingers bled, until their eyes turned swollen and red, and could barely see by candlelight. The Sandman was a stealer of dreams. He would slip into the human world and put children to sleep so he could take their dreams. In the old times, children rarely had dreams because the Sandman stole them as soon as they drifted off to sleep. Eventually, the Sandman's dream appetite got too great, so the townspeople had to come up with a plan to cut him off from sand. <laughs> well, from getting more than he had on him. They built a wall around the town and trapped him outside. Evidently, every other holiday town door was closed always, so until Sally opened the forgotten door in Halloween Town, he was trapped. He couldn't affect the field workers of Dreamtown, don't worry. That was their big plan. Keep him outside the city. The townsfolk had had it with tyrant kings and queens and instead decided to elect Sally's parents as governors. Anyway, let me tell you about the Lullaby Library. Walls and walls of bookshelves, couches, candlelight, a labyrinth of books, the stuff of my dreams, and the only portal into the human world. This is a door made of dark cherry wood with an ornate spiral of nighttime stars etched onto the front, dark and as if the wood had been burnt by a flame. Hmm. It will lead to whichever city's library you picture when entering. Okay, cool. Before we go through that door, and you know we will, we've got some groves to destroy. That's right. Sally's parents want to destroy all their exits to other realms, including this library one, just to keep the Sandman out of their town. He's already put the human world to sleep, though, so by cutting themselves off, they are essentially destroying themselves. Everybody's perpetually asleep already. Dreamtown has no purpose. Sleeping people aren't <clears throat> increasing population and making new sleepers after all, so who's gonna remember this town once everyone's gone? This decision bothers me because it's such short-sightedness from the leadership. I digress. The parents lock Sally up in her childhood room, where she learns how to defeat the Sandman with Halloween Town herbal tea, yay, while they chop down all the holiday trees in their grove. Sally gets there in time to see a single beetle scuttle out of a felled Halloween Town tree, which dang Oogie Boogie is tenacious. That's gotta be him, right? Sally's like, why didn't you wait? I have a plan. Her parents are like, too late, but I guess go try to save your husband via the mortal realm in the library, find a graveyard and take that to Halloween Town. Just choose a small city so you have to walk less. But we're burning down the door after you leave so you can't come back. <laughs> yeah, they were so happy to have her back, but I guess let her go to certain death don't help, right? Sally goes through the portal in the library, but rather than think of any human city, she thinks the word queen and ends up in Queen Elizabeth II's office. <laughs> I know, this came out in the summer, so it's even weirder now. 
Anyway, being in the sleeping mortal's queenly presence fills Sally with resolve that she just might be able to be a great pumpkin queen and still be herself. So there's that. She gets to Halloween Town via the Brompton Cemetery where she mixes the deadly nightshade, black valerian root, foxglove, a pinch of corpse flower meant to mimic the effects of the dead to three times strength, adds the lucky four-leaf clover which turns the potion from red to vibrant grass green. And I'm gonna fly through this because my focus in this is town doors and cool Sally story. Okay, so Sandman is still looking for Sally in Halloween Town, who somehow sews six decoy Sallies. That's six dresses, 12 arms, 12 legs, six heads, etc. all night without the Sandman finding her. <laughs> she poisons the fountain at the center of town with her tea and makes a big speech about how she is the pumpkin queen and she will be the one to stop the Sandman. But then Zero literally saves her by pushing the big guy into the fountain. <laughs> where he falls dead asleep. And everyone magically wakes up! Did the Sandman entering his own sleep interrupt theirs, causing mass awakenings? Jack and Sally decide to check if the human world is awake yet, even though the body of the Sandman is still just floating in the fountain asleep. But surprise! Her parents walk through the door before they can go! Dreamtown ended up deciding not to close the human door right away because why not trust Sally just a little bit, right? Also, they felt that she shouldn't be alone, but she like was. Jack tells Halloween Town sorta of what happened and gets very sassy with Dr. Finkelstein. The town is all deciding what to do with the Sandman's body and all of their grim suggestions would <laughs> definitely make sure he never bothered anyone again. But as he's Dreamtown's property, it's down to Sally's parents who agree to let Halloween Town throw the Sandman off a cliff. But he begins to wake up. Why didn't we take away his dream sand, people? <sighs> but wait, his dark rimmed eyes are gone. So that's what a nap feels like. How wondrous, he says. The Sandman just needed sleep. He's just never slept, never had a dream of his own. No punishment, just ask Sally for her dream tea recipe, basically. They hug it out. Dr. Finkelstein fortunately fares far worse. He gets 100 years community service in Dreamtown, and Sally gets unlimited access to his lab and gardens until the end of time. She also decides by the by to be stuffed with both leaves and the air puff cotton that she was born with, because she's of both worlds now and is a confident pumpkin queen after her adventures. Good job, Sally. But we're not quite done yet. We've got more realms to uncover. You know that grove of trees that Sally's parents destroyed? Well, they planted more from the saplings of the dead trees, and those grew in three days, because, quote, there was old magic in their roots. So, travel is restored, and these trees are even more intriguing to me. <laughs> in other news, all the holiday towns got together for the first time for an all-realms gathering, where the rulers of each world assembled in Halloween Town to discuss all matter of things affecting the holidays like leap year and weather charts and climate change that impacts the ability to visit the human world. The realms now all work together instead of separately. This is the crossover we've all probably wished for, right? Halloween Town, inspired by Valentine's Town, opened a haunted bed and breakfast and a cafe where the Sandman stops to pick up some sleeping tea every so often. There are a number of visitors from other towns too, although no one ever seems to get any sleep in the haunted B&B for some reason. Now, if you thought Dreamtown was cool, hold on to your head because there's an entire orchard of ancient trees. Yes, as Jack and Sally tidy up the space around the Dreamtown tree, they discover, quote, there was never simply a single tree that led to one ancient realm. There is an entire orchard, hidden, tucked away, rows and rows of magical, uncharted trees, doorways into old, long-forgotten towns. Father Time, Old Man Winter, the Tooth Fairy, multitudes of worlds, places we never knew existed, quote. So cool, but why didn't they read Finkelstein's book? It probably listed all of these realms. I honestly think that Tooth Fairy Town would be the most terrifying of all the realms. Like, is this where they keep every tooth they've ever traded for? You know they're working with the dentist from Valentine's Town, right? Now, I need to talk about retconning lore into movies and stories that have been around for decades. Normally, I'm not a fan of how Disney approaches this in general, sorry to say. Now, Disney can of course do whatever they like with the characters in the world they've created. However, there are characters that they straight up didn't create themselves. For example, Gothel really bothers me because she existed in folklore before their story, and it feels like they've ruined her reputation for future generations of story listeners. Her newer, filled-in, evil backstories absolutely change how she's perceived when new viewers see the musical Into the Woods or read the original Rapunzel story for the first time after hearing her Disney-fabricated backstory. With that said, I think that this book, Long Live the Pumpkin Queen, 
does an excellent job of building on top of the existing lore of Halloween Town without rewriting it, as far as the trees are concerned. It enhances it, and while Sally's story is kind of like, wow, that's a big deal, it doesn't change how she should have acted in the original Nightmare Before Christmas film, but it does change how we'll look at Dr. Finkelstein from now on and when rewatching the original movie, where I know he was originally supposed to be the villain, so I guess that works out. But Dr. F is Disney's original character to do whatever they like with, unlike Gobble. The revelation of the orchard of all the ancient realms and trees also doesn't change events that happened in the previous media. I think this retcon is okay and only deepens our understanding of how things work. But yeah, that is the story of Sally and how she is of two worlds and there are so many more worlds we don't know about yet. I loved getting to see a bit more of the other holiday tree towns and I'm looking forward to how things will evolve with these new uncharted realms. I have so many theories running through my brain so do stick around to hear all about them. But which new ancient realm would you like to see more of? Let me know in the comments below. This is the first of many things I'd like to explore about this book versus movie. Consider it a skeleton, if you will, for things to come. Starting right now, because The Nightmare Before Christmas is a world that has slowly evolved over the past 30 years. Yes, it's been that long since it released. And as time goes on, new stories are added to the lore. The Battle for Pumpkin King released on September 23rd of 2023, and what's contained within it really makes me wonder about what the Pumpkin King really is and how Oogie Boogie eventually grew to become the monster he is. We are going to break down the prequel to The Nightmare Before Christmas and how the events in this graphic novel shaped the Halloween world we've all grown to love, all starting from the actions of an old, sinister king of Halloween. So let's set the stage because there's a lot to unpack here. The book opens up with Jack and Oogie Boogie competing in friendly challenges. And this is interesting because they seem like the best of friends. Neither Jack nor Oogie seems upset when they lose, and overall it seems like a very healthy friendship. They are kids and everyone around them is younger too, which raises questions about how people age in Halloween Town, but this is the earliest version of this world we've seen yet. But it isn't long after this that we see the mayor roll into town, but he's not alone. In fact, he's not even driving the car. It seems someone older with more seniority is at the wheel, and they are the one making the announcement. This individual is dressed in black with a white draping collar adorned with a spiderweb brooch and jabot, but their head is a molding old carved jack-o'-lantern, darkening in its core with various black tendrils emitting from it. They hold a cane and their hands look to be gnarly wood, a true scarecrow. They are the Pumpkin King and have been the Pumpkin King for a very long time if this spider lace jabot is anything to go by. But it's immediately after meeting this character that we find out that they have a sinister side. As not long after they announce that they want to host a challenge for the next Pumpkin King, they have an aside thought about how they wish to control the newly elected king, this town, and through them, all of Halloween itself. So right away we're hit with, holy cats and bats, there's a new old king of Halloween? Followed by the thought that he isn't just spooky fun like Jack Skellington, he seems evil and corrupt. Up until this point, the concept and role of the Pumpkin King has been kind of vague. We knew Jack is the king, and in the video games, Oogie and Jack have fought over the title. Although we'll talk about the inconsistencies with the games and novels a bit later. Regardless though, we never knew who the ruler of Halloween Town was, and I've talked about this previously. Is it the mayor, someone who claims that they are just an elected official? Is it the Pumpkin King themselves? Heck, death is lurking in Halloween Town too, and we can find him hiding in certain shots in the movie. The Grim Reaper really seems like he should be the one in charge, no? But this story kind of frames things a bit differently. This old withered pumpkin man we find out is named Edgar. Whether or not there is any connection to Edgar Allan Poe is not mentioned. Anyway, Edgar seems to be powerful and influential, as the story progresses into a series of competitions between Oogie Boogie and Jack Skellington to see who is better suited for the role of Pumpkin King. But all the while, Edgar is really trying to get Oogie Boogie to win. I think he's identified Oogie as the more easily corruptible of the two, literally calling him a vessel to be filled with whatever. In this case, filled with Edgar's evil plans. As the contests play out, Edgar is always whispering into Oogie's ear, chattering for him to cheat and bend the rules, to take advantage of shortcuts when no one is looking. Oogie seems naively impressionable because being the Pumpkin King seems so important, and on top of that, he wants to win against his friend Jack, like in old times. This story makes it seem like Oogie was more so transformed into being a villain, rather than Oogie natively being bad to his core. 
Eventually, Edgar takes young Oogie back to his lair, which fans will recognize as Oogie Boogie's lair pre-Casino Makeover. As Pumpkin King, Edgar would eventually give the lair to Oogie Boogie, but at this part in the story, Oogie has already lost the first challenge, which was a pumpkin carrying contest, the goal being to retrieve as many pumpkins as possible in a short period of time. Oogie smashed his pumpkins en route and has less whole pumpkins than Jack did. Jack also dropped and smashed pumpkins, but assembled a jack-o'-lantern out of the pieces, and the judges vote for Jack's creativity. So, the takeaway from the contest was that Oogie felt like he got cheated out of winning. Edgar takes notice of this and feeds into it by telling Oogie what he wants to hear. While within Edgar's lair, Edgar comforts Oogie and then eventually turns him to the idea of cheating in the competition himself. Edgar states, he's not going to play fair, so why should we? If cheating is the only way to win the game, then the object of the game itself is to cheat. By this point, lots of bugs and snakes and other slithery creatures have been gathering around them for quite some time. Edgar seemingly draws them to this location, before ultimately scooping them up into cups. The first batch of snake and spider stew? The more creepy crawlers that Oogie ingests, the more twisted he seems to become. And this is kind of interesting because it seems like Oogie Boogie got lured somewhere and was coerced into being more chaotic. Edgar's true goal is to make Halloween Town a truly terrifying place, a place where fear rules and he needs his successor to feel the same and be a puppet. However, we need to remember what Edgar said at the beginning of the graphic novel, I can maintain control of them, this town, and even Halloween itself them being the new Pumpkin King who, at this point, Edgar believes is destined to be Oogie Boogie. And as the story plays out, it's not too far of a stretch to believe that Edgar filling Oogie Boogie with vile things made Oogie more vile himself. Because during the second challenge, we realize that this old Pumpkin King has some magical powers. So the second challenge involves building a tower of bones, and whoever can build the tallest tower will be deemed the winner. But as the towers are being built, Edgar of course attempts to cheat by bringing bones to Oogie so he can build without having to retrieve bones from the surrounding boneyard area. This seems a little disrespectful to the dead, but as Jack's tower grows taller, Edgar reveals that he has the power to control the wind itself, which is interesting because from a lore perspective, there really isn't a whole lot of magic per se in the series. We have a mad scientist who creates things, Sally who has premonitions and potion skills, and Jack's experiments, but the fact that this Pumpkin King can command the wind to do his bidding is very interesting. Is it the power of the Pumpkin King, or was it something that this old scarecrow always had? Jack's tower is blown over and he loses, and the third challenge begins. This challenge involves carving pumpkins, and of course there's plenty of cheating to be had here as well. Long story short, Oogie ends up losing because he spends more time heckling Jack than he does actually carving a good pumpkin. But by the time the competition is over, Edgar casts Oogie out as he claims Oogie did not try hard enough even with him bending the rules in his favor. By this point, Oogie is already gone. Unlike the Oogie that this story starts with, this more sinister version says he doesn't need Edgar and that he will be seizing his lair. He casts aside his friendship with Jack as he retreats. Edgar congratulates Jack on his victory, and then the old Pumpkin King retreats to the pumpkin patch under the iconic Spiral Hill. He mutters to himself that it's a shame his plan depended on such a loser to carry it out. Meanwhile, as the story draws to a close, Oogie Boogie claims no one will ever cheat him again as he overtakes Edgar's old lair. And it seems that going forward from this moment, Oogie Boogie never broke free from the effects of Edgar. Sure, it could have just been Oogie Boogie's core character all along, but there's something about the setup between Edgar and Oogie that makes it feel like Oogie was a bit of a victim. If a demon hands you a cup and you drink from it, are you at fault? Oogie Boogie was so blinded by the idea of winning friendly competitions with his rival that he eventually became twisted when something so monumental was added as a reward. He believed he could trust Edgar, even when he thought Edgar's advice didn't make sense. But all of it was just a ploy in Edgar's eyes, Oogie was expendable. As Edgar lays down in the pumpkin patch at the end of the book, he claims, Oh well, for now at least I can finally have some peace. Okay, Edgar. 
And this just goes to show how uncaring he was all along. While he is here resting and forgetting about how bad the day was, Oogie Boogie is forever changed. A self-banished monster who, as far as I can tell, still seems to be under the effects of Edgar's curse. And like I said, those core obsessive traits may have always been in Oogie Boogie, but it's hard to argue that Edgar didn't play a role in creating the villain of the series. He not only filled Oogie up with bugs and evil ideas, but Edgar divided a friendship by pulling strings behind the scenes. And at the end of the day, the old Pumpkin King couldn't even care less. Now, those of you who have watched, read, and played all forms of media revolving around The Nightmare Before Christmas may be thinking, wait a second, none of this makes sense. How are Jack and everyone else children? I thought the residents of Halloween Town were ageless. Well, minus that one time right after the original movie released, where we discovered Jack eventually becomes a father, <laughs> yeah, that was a bit of a doozy, but I digress. The thing is, it's hard to tell what is canon and what isn't, truly. Like in the Game Boy Advance game, The Pumpkin King, Jack and Oogie haven't even met yet, despite the game only taking place one year before the movie, whereas this graphic novel depicts events way before then. And in this book, Jack already knows who Sally is, whereas in the quote-unquote prequel game, I think he meets Sally for the first time a year before the events of the movie. So there is definitely some inconsistency with the lore, for sure. But I suppose when you have different mediums, a movie, games, books, etc., which have different contributing writers written piecemeal over the span of 30 years, it's no surprise things don't line up. But the implications of this story in particular are kind of wild. I mean, Lock, Shock, and Barrel are babies here. We see how they first interact with and meet Oogie Boogie, becoming Boogie's boys from babydom. But were they born here? Did they die as kids? Sally's hair is much shorter and apparently can grow. No spoilers for the Pumpkin Queen book here. Unless she just replaced it by sewing on longer hair. And although the mayor is, quote, just an elected official, he's still the mayor here for like ever ago. We have Edgar over here talking about how he doesn't even want to retire and how he isn't ready to do so. Meanwhile, the mayor feels like he's been the mayor for, well, <laughs> forever. Edgar's position as Pumpkin King is one of tenured status, but it isn't known how long he actually served for. And yet, he's also the only person who seemingly has direct magical powers outside of squeezing down chimneys and making reindeer fly. Jack is a self-proclaimed master of fright, but aside from his general obsessive curiosity, I don't recall him having a special holiday power of wind? On that note, Edgar does eventually lay to rest in the pumpkin patch, and it makes you wonder if that's where all pumpkin kings eventually lay to rest. Are all these jack-o'-lanterns the spirits of past kings? Although in the movie, Jack talks about the only thing remaining of him after a million years will be dust and a plaque. The Spiral Hill, Cemetery, and Pumpkin Patch are all right next to each other, so it does get you thinking. Canon or not, although the challenges themselves and the flow of the novel can feel a bit silly at times, I did really enjoy the deeper meaning that these prequel ideas added to the lore of the world in The Nightmare Before Christmas. So with all of this new information from games, graphic novels, and books, we can actually make a pretty good triangulation on where Halloween Town would be located in the real world. I'm even going to get into crops and growing seasons and how the holiday trees technically work, so you know it's going to be a fun time. If you skipped here to avoid spoilers, I've avoided them in this quick kind of recap. Have you ever wanted to live in or visit Halloween Town, or any of the other towns and more? Well, I'm going to go over everything about how to get there from our mortal human world, how to travel between realms, where they could actually be located in our real world, and even going back into the most ancient and lost ones too. So there are some spoilers there, but I'll give you warnings and time codes. I'm going up the movie, of course, the manga, Sally's Long Live the Pumpkin Queen book, Zero's manga, the Mirror Moon manga, the original illustrated poem by Tim Burton, and the 2021 production art book for good measure. Phew, yeah, that's a lot. As the movie starts off, we learn that each realm's sole function is to create a holiday for mortals to enjoy. Halloween Town makes Halloween spooky however they can. They have one job, and presumably this one job is different per each person's beliefs and where they live. For example, All Hallows' Eve, Samhain, All Souls, Dio de Muertos, etc. could all be variations on Halloween Town, and of course there would be more completely different holidays for different beliefs. 
In the movie, we start off in a mostly American and Christian grove of trees and go through the Halloween town door. Each door leads to a different holiday town, and we find out later that each holiday realm has its own circle grove of trees to the other holiday towns for visiting and kidnapping Sandy Claus. So you could go from Halloween town to Valentine's Day town and back just by going through the grove trees. For full details on each of these realms and more, hop back to the timestamp below. In the movie, Jack does this when he first finds the tree tree door. He falls in but then has to come home with his stolen Christmas contraband and his new ride somehow, presumably through the Halloween town door in Christmas Town's grove. The manga follows this well and so does Zero's story. In Sally's story, she visits every single tree in the grove, some multiple times, and gets back to Halloween Town via each of the other realm's grove trees. A major problem arises when Spoiler Town destroys their grove of trees, but I'll cover that in the next section. But yeah, these trees can be destroyed and regrown in three days because of the quote, old magic in their roots, quote, the more you know. Now here's something interesting. All the other realms know about this circle of trees, how it works, and all about the other holiday towns. Only Halloween Town was out of the loop. Why? Well, it seems that each realm might have a quote, book of traditions, like the kind elf in Zero's Adventures. This book details where their trees are and how they are arranged. So helpful. Jack seemed to be the first to discover Halloween Town's grove of trees after a particularly morose Halloween, but spoiler, Dr. Finkelstein actually has a book detailing ancient realms in the new Sally book. He's been out of the town and kept it to himself for secret spoiler reasons. This would explain how other realms knew of each other, but Halloween Town was kept in the dark for so long, and how Jack naively proceeded to mess up and improve things so spectacularly. Everyone else knew not to muddle, but not poor old Jack. But these inner realm groves are not the only tree doors. Oh, not at all. Ahoy, pumpkin queen spoilers. Outside of the circle trees, there's an entire orchard of trees, more ancient ones that predate the current Nightmare Before Christmas circle. Spoiler Realm is on the periphery of this, but there's also Tooth Fairy Realm, Father Time, and Old Man Winter, to name a few. It seems anything that any human at any point believed in is a realm with a tree, which is very exciting to me. Why don't these ancient gods and beings come out? Well, that's twofold. I think belief in something would make it accessible again, but also, spoiler, if a door is blocked, which many of these were, someone or thing from that realm cannot travel into the realm that blocked the door. So if you don't want uninvited guests, just lock the doors. For example, Halloween Town's door to Spoiler Realm was blocked. Vines and such had overgrown and overtaken the door. Partly on purpose, Dr. Finkelstein wanted to hide something, and partly through time. Only when Sally moves them and opens the door herself does something come through. Had she not done that, it never would have invaded, without going roundabout through the mortal realm, which I'll get to right now. As it's the literal job of every town to manufacture mortal holidays, they have to be able to get to the mortals somehow. In addition to each holiday town having its own set of grove doors to other towns and an orchard of ancient realm doors, there are also what I'll call mortal portals. In Christmas Town, it's likely via the sky. Sandy Claus's sleigh can up, up, and away and be out and about like a vulture in the mortal realm skies. How mortals would get to Christmas Town is by presumably <laughs> dropping in or flying up a chimney, putting on Santa's suit. <laughs> I'm just conjecturing now, but let's get back to the fact track, such as it is. Halloween Town's mortal portal is through the cemetery, of course. Not only is this where the This Is Halloween procession appears to be coming into the town square from, but after Jack's lament, he's able to travel through a grave where he crash landed in the mortal realm and back into Halloween Town's cemetery. This is also how it happens in Long Live the Pumpkin Queen. Spoiler Realm has burned their inter-realm grove, blocking off Sally's quick exit to Halloween Town. Now, the only way for Sally to get back to Halloween Town is through the Mortal Realm first. She must go via Spoiler Realm's Mortal Portal, which is a door in a library that takes you to whichever city you picture's library. So it's a door to any library, which is so cool and especially handy if you have an overdue book. Anyway, once Sally does that, she finds a nearby cemetery to open a door back to Halloween Town with. It would be interesting if any mortal could just enter Halloween Town that way, right? I mean, don't go poking around graves, but if Lockshock and Barrow were mortal trick-or-treaters at one point, I think it's very likely this is how they found their way into Halloween Town, either by following Jack in the parade or else just on their own. They do seem like the type to hang out in cemeteries, after all. I'm guessing that St. Patrick's Day Mortal Portal is via the end of a rainbow. The book depicts this town as a very stereotypical Americanized version of the holiday. Because when that town is in danger, the only other functional being not victim to spoiler is a leprechaun who is obsessed with finding the ends of the rainbow. I rather think that that means that this is the way of escaping to the mortal realm. And if a mortal found the end of a rainbow, they could be transported to St. Patrick's Day Town and presumably find gold, right? 
back to Spooky Realm, it seems that Halloween Town has another way to get to the Mortal Realm, and that's also the sky. Jack flies his skeleton deer and coffin contraption up, up, and away into the Mortal Realm the same way Sandy Claus does, to deliver all his horridly delightful presents to the unsuspecting mortals. And Sandy Claus visits Halloween Town this same way at the end of the movie and Zero Story. So either it's a Christmas and Halloween special bridge, or every realm can also be exited by the sky, perhaps. Which makes me wonder if, in fact, these are all places that could exist in physical latitude and longitude. In a playful head in the clouds, I want to live where the spooky things are, since, of course. Like, if all you had to do to get out of a holiday town into the mortal realm was float, fly, etc., it would make sense that your town occupied a physical location. This works so beautifully and easily with Christmas Town, which is a snowy toy factory operating 24-7, 365, in constant snow, perpetually evergreen trees, and darkness. This type of place actually exists in our mortal world, the Northern Pole. Things get trickier with other holidays. Valentine's Day Town is a lot of sweets and candy, and because it's focused on love, maybe the weather isn't important for most, uh, loving activities. It's also very flower-focused, but greenhouses could be used to grow beautiful bouquet components all year round, whatever the weather. This could be a real-life place, uh, anywhere, really. So again, St. Patrick's Day Town, and look, I am just going off how the book describes it, even though it's an American version, feels like it wants to be somewhere on the Emerald Isle. It's described as a cool, minty forest, lush green and stunted because it's where the leprechauns live. Easter Town, a meadow of plastic grass, and Fourth of July Town, which is just a perpetual explosive fireworks show, are kind of more synthetic and also less dependent on changing seasons and weather. Easter could exist in a perpetually warm but not hot, don't want to melt the grass and rot the eggs, area. And Fourth of July Town could be a desert. I mean, it's just perpetual explosions and testing, so I'm pretty sure such a testing site for more dangerous things already exists in the real American desert, right? Thanksgiving Town and Halloween Town are the ones that kind of break this mold, though. Thanksgiving Town is regrettably not run by turkeys, but in a state of perpetual ready-to-eat crops in a low valley. Corn, wheat, pumpkins, and gangs of wild turkeys. The issue is, the weather is described as cold, and there's snow on the way, and the tree's leaves have already changed colors, even though it takes place after Halloween Town, where the leaves are already gone. I'm not a farmer, but I think you need a relatively warm growing season for parts of the crop's life cycles. I'm not sure where this type of climate in crops would fit into the actual mortal world, but dang it, it's the best lead, so get your work boots on because I'm gonna get deep into crop triangulation. Here, let me show you. Corn is a summertime crop, taking between 55 and 95 growing degree days of 75 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit and 15 or more inches of water to produce mature ears of corn, and 130 or more frost-free days. This looming snow of Thanksgiving Town concerns me here. It does best in zones 4 through 8. Wheat has a spring variety, 128 days, and a winter one, 240. In the USA, there are six classes of wheat grown across 42 states and many zones. The book is not specific in which species of wheat this is, but given winter is coming, let's say it's wintry. Pumpkins can be grown in zones 3 through 7 and have a long growing season, 75 to 100 frost-free days. For an October harvest, northern locations need to plant by late May, more southern areas by early July. Now Thanksgiving Town is a November holiday and at the end of the month at that, so maybe they're located somewhere where they were able to push back their planting by a month as well. Anyway, checking out these maps, you see we have a lot of overlap, but given that the leaves have changed colors and some historical context, that puts us somewhere in this region here, for Thanksgiving Town at least. And the same with Halloween Town, where it's not so much growing things, but the unchanging state of decay of things. Visually, Halloween Town looks like an East Coastal adjacent area. The winding hills, the building styles, and especially the old Americana-style gravestones. Chronologically, it's before Thanksgiving Town. The book states they go in American holiday order, and its jack-o'-lanterns are fresh. But every living plant is in its near-death phase. They look dry and not really fresh to me. Halloween is already such an ephemeral time. Crisp leaves falling, the last throws of harvester crops, and the fact that this is a constant makes me scratch my head as to where this nothing grows fully but is always decaying climate could be in our real world. And it's when I get to this point that I think, dang, I'm overthinking this again. That's not the point of Halloween Land. I mean, it is so fun. But I also remember the intro where each town exists only to make a holiday that each person believes in, however they believe it to be. Halloween Town can be in its frozen state of ungrowth but always decaying, if that's what you believe in, or what brightens you the most. Each little town can be its own world, like snow globes that can exist in any climate, and each person can have their own little collection to pull out when it's time to celebrate whatever it's time to celebrate. 
And that is everything about the tree doors in The Nightmare Before Christmas. Which doors would you like to try to go through? Which would be the most, well, <laughs> nightmarish, especially given those new ones? Okay, now that we're in the real world, let's apply some real world science to Jack's experiments to see just what in the name of science is he doing? What does it mean? What does it mean? Just what exactly is Jack Skellington testing for in all the stolen Christmas bric-a-brac? Yes, I know Christmas, but confound it all, what exactly in the experiments he sets up is he looking for in the real world sense? Simple montage, nothing more, or something bigger at its core. It's been buzzing in my skull for far too long, so I had to know. What is he doing? What is he doing? And most importantly, why were his experiments doomed to fail from the very start? In The Nightmare Before Christmas, Jack Skellington sets out to determine what makes Christmas Christmas using the scientific method. Dr. Finkelstein lends Jack various laboratory equipment, like a microscope, test tube, beakers, and whatever else he was able to shove in his bag that's obviously connected to another dimension because there's no way all that fit in there and didn't break. I mean, glass beakers and test tubes bouncing around in a bag? No way those survived intact. Aside from the fact that you can't determine the components that make up Christmas using steam, Jack seems to be one of those friends who has no idea what they're doing with your very precious possessions. I guess being Pumpkin King has its perks, though. To further investigate this, we'll be getting a little extra science today, using a little scientific method of our own, and starting in Halloween Town and ending up somewhere in crime scene and forensic sciences. So put your lab goggles on and actually button up your lab coat for today's scientifically magical dive. Let's start with Jack's first experiment, looking at a holly berry using a microscope. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a science class where you had to make a wet mount slide out of onion skin in order to see the plant cell walls, but it seems Jack never did. For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, a wet mount is a quick way to take a thin or small specimen and examine it closely under a microscope say, the very thin skin of an onion or a couple drops of pond water to see microorganisms swimming around. You take a glass slide, place your specimen atop it, add a few drops of water, and complete the microscopic sandwich with a thin, sometimes shorter, glass cover slip. With this process in mind, let's try to roughly apply this to a holly berry in the real world first. Maybe you managed to get a very thin layer of skin off the berry. You would take that, carefully lay it on your slide, add a couple of drops of water, and then cover it with the cover slip. This is a temporary use slide as the water will eventually dry out due to evaporation, but you could potentially see the cell walls that make up the holly berry, which, while very cool, is ultimately unhelpful if you're trying to understand the magic of a holiday at a microscopic level, in the real world anyway. I'd give Jack the benefit of the doubt in finding this holiday magic in cell walls if he didn't do what would make every single person who has ever professionally used a microscope cringe. Jack put a whole specimen on a microscope slide and then proceeded to zoom in and in and then started to squish the holly berry, which when you get anywhere near a microscope slide, you should know to back off unless you're using an oil immersion lens with oil on your slide, which is not the case here, because scientists know that if you touch that slide, you can damage your objective lens, which is the magnification lens on the bottom of the microscope. Kind of a big deal. So the fact that Jack touched the holly berry at all was a big Christmas red stop sign. But Jack continued until he squished the berry and cracked the slide. Oh, shivers. Which is definitely a big no when working with microscopes if you ever want them to work again. Big fail. R.I.P. Dr. Finkelstein's microscope. Failed. Okay, so Jack failed at biology. Maybe he fared better at chemistry. Narrator, he most definitely did not. Admittedly, I have no clue what's in the vat that Jack drops the candy cane into and then proceeds to electrocute, but let's just assume it's water. Those in the know know that candy canes are just pure sugar and food dye. You'd think the Pumpkin King, coming from a holiday land where candy is super popular for trick-or-treaters, would be able to recognize this, but alas for poor old Jack. Anyway, if you put sugar into water, it just dissolves. Possibly Jack even used electricity to heat the water, which would only make the candy cane dissolve faster and not turn into a limp spaghetti noodle. Failed. But, 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 but. In the interest of science, I was wondering what would make a candy cane be able to change shape. Turns out, if you heat a candy cane at a low temperature, somewhere around 250 degrees Fahrenheit, in a pan in the oven for a few minutes, the bonds between the sugar crystals that make up the typical candy cane structure will weaken with heat, allowing you to carefully twist the candy cane into a different shape. 
As it cools, the candy cane will stay in its new shape because the bonds will reform in the absence of heat. If you'd like to take a crack at this little experiment, do be sure to use wax paper so the candy cane doesn't stick to your pan. Fortunately for the residents of Halloween Town and probably the holidays at large, Jack only had one other big experiment, crushing a glass ornament and putting it into a bubbling beaker of unknown clear liquid, maybe ectoplasm? Anyway, it gives off a pulsing green glow. Interesting reaction, but what does it mean? Well, in theory, it's an oscillating chemiluminescence reaction, but that would have been impossible given what he actually added. Chemiluminescence is a fancy science word for the emission of light in a chemical reaction. Simply-ish stated, chemiluminescence is when two compounds enter an excited, high-energy state where an electron is bumped from a lower energy level to a higher one. But atoms don't like having extra electrons, so they want to get rid of them. In the process of chemiluminescence, they release that extra energy in the form of a photon, or light. If the light is emitted in a visible wavelength somewhere between 400 and 700 nanometers, we see a visible flash when the atom lets go of its extra electron. There are different kinds of chemiluminescence reactions based on what's involved. One interesting chemiluminescence reaction is mixing luminol with hydrogen peroxide, which forms a blue light. Ooh. Luminol is actually a compound made of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon used by forensic investigators to detect trace amounts of blood at crime scenes because it reacts with the iron in the hemoglobin, which is the protein found in red blood cells. They mix the luminol powder with a liquid containing hydrogen peroxide, a hydroxide, and some other chemicals. Then they put the liquid in a spray bottle. The luminol and hydrogen peroxide are the compounds that are actually creating the chemical reaction, but in order to produce a strong glow, a catalyst is needed to accelerate the process, which in this case is iron from the hemoglobin. Chemiluminescence can also be seen in some living organisms, where it's referred to as bioluminescence. Okay, but that was just regular chemiluminescence. What's happening in Jack's experiment is an oscillating reaction where the components in the reaction fluctuate, going from A to B and then A to B again and repeat. A more commonly known oscillating reaction, the briggs rosser oscillating reaction, oscillates from a clear solution to blue, then light yellow, and clear again. But Jack's experiment appears to do that too, not just flashing once, but pulsing a green glow. Ooh, luminol can be used in an oscillating reaction, giving off blue pulses, but we saw that it would need a lot of other chemicals for the reaction to occur in the first place. Not really sure of anything that would have been in a Christmas ornament to cause chemiluminescence, let alone an oscillating chemiluminescence reaction. Failed. Or did Jack actually succeed, finding a magic that cannot be explained away by mortal sciences? Was a holiday spirit or magic in that ornament after all? What does it mean? And so we find ourselves, as Jack did, no closer to figuring out what makes Christmas Christmas. Which makes total sense because the holiday spirit isn't something you can test. It's invisible but everywhere. Just because we cannot see it doesn't mean we can't believe it, after all. Like Jack, I overanalyzed an obsession of my own and came out with a deeper understanding of what the science experiments performed could have tested for. I personally think Jack was onto something with his spider snowflakes, they were the coolest. This whole thing was quite the obsessive deep dive, but I do hope you enjoyed it. Let me know which part of all of the Nightmare Before Christmas theories and lore was your favorite, and which lore you'd like me to explore more in a future video in the comments below. And do subscribe so you won't miss the next one bubbling in the cauldron right now. Goodbye!